This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome this evening. Um, we have some announcements before we get started. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite some time. Um, this evening we're joined um, by Kelly Drennan of uh, NOAA Federal. Um, I'll do some announcements and then I'll turn it over to her after I, I have a little to share about her. So um, just some club business is photo of the month. You can uh, vote for September. You can submit for October. And congratulations to LJ Grimm 13 um, is our August photo of the month. And just a reminder, every month the club gives away a $50 gift certificate um, to the winning photos. Um, so please join that. We will have a booth October 8th and 9th at Reef of Palooza. We'll be in the lobby, so please stop by. We are looking for some volunteers to help Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So Friday before the event starts. Um, and so uh, there's sign up on the website or reach out to me. Our next club meeting is going to be October 21st with Piscine Energetics. And um, it will also be a hybrid meeting. So we'll be both Zoom as well as at the local fish store called the Big Little Fish Store there in Dallas. Um, November 5th is the Fall Frag Swap. And that is going to be the last day to pick up your bounce back prizes. Um, earlier this week, today just Wednesday, <laughs> Monday, I guess, was uh, part three of the bounce back contest. So uh, we're having a little challenge with some uh, conversations through the website. Mark is helping out and looking at what in the world's going on. So I was only able to reach out through the website to about 49 people. And from my secretary at dfwmass.org, I'm right. Uh, reaching out through the email addresses that I have from the webmaster. So they're coming directly to you. Um, I guess that's 150 some people. Um, so, um, and you can either pick up your prizes in advance, get with me, we'll make arrangements. You can stop by my house if you'd like, um, or the fall frag swap is uh, the last, last date for pickup. Um, November's meeting is going to be a show your tank for those of you who want to plan for that plan ahead and then the Christmas party is December 8th at a member's house in Grand Prairie. Um, so those are all the club announcements I have and we'll do a recap at the end of the highlights. And I am so excited. So let me just start with the spring frag swap. February. Find that up right. Okay. February Reader's Digest. This is the large print edition. Um, but this is featuring Texas coral reefs. And, and I had no idea. And I thought, if I don't know, how many other people don't know? And I am so blessed um, I'm to uh, introduce you guys to, to Kelly. Thank you so much for, for uh, coming this evening. She's an education and outreach specialist with NOAA Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, and she's been teaching marine science as an informal educator for about 30 years, including positions in education at Moody Gardens and SeaWorld of Florida. She's also a certified elementary school teacher in Texas and taught fourth grade for two years in South Houston. That must have been tough. Um, her work, kids are, kids are just tough. You adults can be tough. Um, her work with the sanctuary includes community events, presentations, conferences, teacher workshops, holy cow, lesson development, social media, and the sanctuary's website, as well as collaborations with zoos and aquariums. She's also a certified scuba diver and has occasionally assisted with offshore, offshore research and monitoring activities. Kelly has a bachelor's degree in Spanish with a minor in mathematics. Wow. From uh, yay, James Madison University in Virginia. In her free time, she enjoys exploring the outdoors, camping, and playing volleyball. And so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And I'm going to go on mute. Thank you. So as uh, Lisa said, my name is Kelly Grinnan, and I'm the education outreach specialist for Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. 
I've been part of the sanctuary team since 2004, and I do a little bit of everything, a little jack of all trades kind of stuff, including the technology. So when we run webinars and things, it's my job to make sure all the audio and visual and all that stuff is is working. <laughs> so, uh, and, and as she mentioned, I was part of the dive team on and off over the years. So I have helped install mooring buoys. I've done fish surveys. I've helped find the research stations that need to be photographed repeatedly each year and had a wide variety of experiences that just make me a better educator and better outreach person because I, I've had some of those experiences myself, not just talking about what other people are telling me. So today, I'm to you about one of the marine protected areas of the National Marine Sanctuary System. A lot of people don't even realize we have this system. It's a system of marine protected areas managed by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. National Marine Sanctuary is one of national parks. They're just all underwater. And national parks, well, they started in 1872. National Marine Sanctuary started in 1972, which makes this the 50th anniversary year. In fact, the anniversary of the National Marine Sanctuary Act is October 23rd this year. So we're coming up on the 50th. And this 40 shirt that I have on here, I just got today. Um, this is one of the things they came out with with the National Marine Sanctuary anniversary. It's a Hawaiian shirt by Reina, apparently a big name in Hawaiian shirts. Um, um, but anybody who go out there and buy them, and they actually say National Marine Sanctuary 50th anniversary on the inside label. So if you're interested, there's, there's information out there. Um, so today, the flower garden bank, the one we're going to talk about, is the only National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's home to beautiful, thriving coral reefs but they are over a hundred miles offshore. And just like Lisa said, most people's response is, there's a coral reef where? People think of Florida, they think of the Bahamas, they think of Mexico, they think of the Great Barrier Reef before they ever, ever think of the coast of Texas. And that's partly because they're not easily accessible and so not many people have ever been there. The sanctuary consists of a total of 17 different banks that stretch across 160 miles of the continental shelf off the Texas and Louisiana coastline. These banks are anywhere from 80 to 125 miles from shore at their closest points, and they create a chain of protected habitats for important species, those that are ecologically and economically important across the northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And the connections between these banks are both biological and geological. When you look at this map here, you can actually see those geological connections, see some of the contours leading from one bank to the next. When Flower Park Bank's National Marine Sanctuary was designated in 1992, yes, this is our 30th anniversary year. Our 30th was back in January, but we've been celebrating all year long. It consisted of just two banks, East Flower Garden Bank and West Flower Garden Bank. The coral reefs I mentioned earlier are found on top of these banks and were the reason for the sanctuary designation. In 1996, Congress added Stetson Bank to the sanctuary. And the top of this bank has what we call a coral community, which is something I'll explain a little more in a bit. And then in 2021, the remaining reefs and banks were added to the sanctuary to protect additional coral communities and a variety of mesophotic or, or low light habitat. Sanctuary banks are a combination of small underwater mountains, ridges, troughs, hard bottom patches, all this associated with underlying salt zones. These are formations underneath the seafloor that have caused it to pucker upward and that salt is, you can see an example of all these different features that can form from that in this map of Rankin and 28,000 banks. Those are two of the newer banks in the sanctuary. Lots of uh, upthrusted areas with a main dome uh, right over here at Rankin Bank and here at, at 28,000 Bank, but lots of ridges, troughs, all sorts of things. But what is the salt dome? What forms this? Well, the salt dome is an isolated layer of salt that's been pushed up to overlying sediments by internal pressures. In a lot of cases, these pockets of salt have actually liquefied, and they're less dense than the surrounding stuff and try to push their way upward. In some places, the salt layer breaks through the seafloor completely. In other, it just forces it to bulge upwards, like the banks you see here. And all of that movement causes faults and cracks in the overlying and surrounding rock, which is what makes salt domes great places for oil and gas exploration. All that cracking and faulting allows little pockets of oil to travel through pathways to join up with other pockets, creating bigger reservoirs of oil and gas that are more likely to be accessible through drilling activity. At some sites, the salt that lies beneath the dome is a few feet beneath the seafloor sediments, and others it might be over 10,000 feet deep. But the action of its pushing on the layers above has forced the seafloor up nevertheless. In addition, the salt plug itself that can be anywhere from a half mile 
to two miles across. So salt domes are kind of a mystery to people on land because they've never encountered or heard them before, or they at least think they haven't. But here in Texas, we actually have salt in Louisiana, salt domes along the coastline. So High Island, Texas, a big birding spot is actually a salt dome. That's why it's called High Island, it's a race area. Um, also Avery Island over in Louisiana where you get your Tabasco sauce from, that is also a salt dome. And they actually extract salt from the dome to use in the recipe that they use to make Tabasco sauce. So salt domes can be found on land, but also under the sea. And they mostly form because of the changing levels of sea uh, over the ice ages and the pockets of salt came from evaporation initially, and then as the seas refilled, sediments and things formed in over top of them. So why are these banks so special? Well, the upthrusted rock at the salt domes provides gathering places for pelagic or open ocean species, and it also provides structure for things like corals and sponges and algae to settle. And this creates pockets of reef habitat across the continental shelf. The reef habitats of the century fall into three main categories. We have coral reefs, coral communities, and mesophotic habitats. So let's start with the coral reefs. The coral reefs at East and West Flower Garden Bank were the original reason for sanctuary designation. These are the northernmost coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is what they look like. Massive amounts of coral that stretch as far as the eye can see, and yes, it really is that clear out there. Uh, you get about 30 miles off the Gallatin coast and everything clears up very nicely and it's like the Caribbean. In fact, some people call it the Texas Caribbean. The dominant species in the sanctuary of corals in the sanctuary are brain corals and star corals, many of which are on the endangered species list or considered threatened species. And the reefs out here start deeper than most coral reefs, approximately 55 to 60 feet underwater. You can get a feel for the depth from this photo. That's our vessel up here at the surface, the shadow kind of, the hull of the vessel up there with some lines hanging down for our safety stuff. Diver midway down to the reef and then the reef stretching as far as you can see below. The sandy area you see between the corals is at about 80 feet depth. So these are the healthiest coral reefs in the greater Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico region with over 52% coral cover, which is as much as five times the amount of coral cover you're gonna find on other reefs in the region. And we know this because of the studies we do year after year, we call it long-term monitoring. We take photos at the same stations every year. We do random surveys across the reef with photos. We do fish surveys and others. And we have by far the highest amount of coral cover, as well as how long that coral cover has been in place. The monitoring started over 30 years ago, and we have as much coral now as we did then. And as you can see in these images, the coral formations have literally piled up on one another over thousands of years. From sand flats, you can see reef formations rising up 15 to 20 feet in some places, and this is what we call high profile reef. And although all of it may look like dead rock, you all know this lay, top layer of all this is alive. So the corals build a stony skeleton underneath themselves, but the coral animals on top, the animal on top is a, is a, a network of small interconnected polyps. And these polyps are like venture sea anemones with soft tubular bodies and a ring of tentacles at the top. And I know you all are aquarium hobbyists and a lot of you raise these corals, but did you know that the reef building corals, the polyps always have tentacles in multiples of six. These soft corals, the octocorals, multiples of eight, and that's where the name octocoral comes from. So your stony or reef building corals are also sometimes referred to as hexacorals, although there are some others in that, in that category too, they're not reef building species. And so the stony aspect of the reef is the cal calcium carbonate skeleton that the polyps build underneath themselves. And the color in their tissues comes from the symbiotic algae called zooxanthellae that live inside the polyp tissue. So a nice close-up of the polyps there on the right, and then lots of reef formation in the other pictures. Some of the formations out here grow as big as small cars. There's also a coral reef at the Grail Bank, one of the newer areas of the sanctuary, um, but this is much deeper, at approximately 144 feet underwater. And it's not quite as extensive or as well studied as the ones at East and West Flower Garden Bay. It's also unique in the way it's dominated by blushing star coral, a species that's not found in large quantities anywhere else. And at this depth, it's out of reach for most scuba divers. So these photos come from ROV explorations or remotely operated vehicles. So next category, coral communities. These are areas that have some reef building coral, but most of their habitat is covered in algae and sponges. So just find the occasional 
coral colony rather than being the dominant part of the habitat. Stetson, Bright, Geyer, and Sonier Banks are the locations where you'll find these coral communities in the sanctuary. These coral communities include most of the same fish and invertebrate species as the flower garden banks, but the animals are much more out in the open at these banks because there just aren't as many places to hide. Stetson and Sonia are what we call mid-shelf banks. They're approximately 80 miles from land. And again, like the other, like the flower garden banks, they start about 55 to 60 feet underwater. The coral communities on these two banks look very similar. They have rocky ridges, rubble flats, lots of algae and sponges. The Stetson photo on the slide shows the one location, the bottom left there, the highest peak at Stetson Bank. It is absolutely covered in coral. That's almost all the coral you're going to find at Stetson Bank these days. There were some more colonies that we were tracking for many years through our long-term monitoring, uh, but Rita, the hurricane that came through after Katrina, did a good job at wiping things clean off there. So some of those com got completely dislodged or destroyed, and we haven't seen a whole lot of new coral colonies starting out there. So this one peak is the main area where you're actually going to find the refilling coral and not much else on the bank. When you get to um, Bright and Geyer banks, they are also within recreational dive limits, but they're out at the edge of the continental shelf, more like the flower garden banks. But they're approximately 124 miles from land and a minimum depth from 105 to 116 feet underwater. And of these, only Stetson Bank is set up with mooring buoy locations at this time. It is regularly part of dive trips to the flower garden banks, which is why the mooring buoys are there, as well as at the flower garden banks, and that prevents people from anchoring and damaging these sensitive habitats. As we move forward with plans for the expanded sanctuary areas, we will likely install moorings also at Geyer and Bright Banks and probably Sonia Bank as well. Together, these coral reefs and coral communities provide habitat for a variety of Caribbean species. But because we are so far removed from the next closest coral reefs, anywhere from 430 to 790 miles, we don't have as much biodiversity here as the rest of the Caribbean. What we do have is a balanced subset. That distance has been a determining factor in whether the larvae that float through the currents get that far before settling, or whether the living, the adult fishes are willing to swim that far. And oil and gas platforms, frankly, in the Gulf of Mexico have actually enhanced the ability of the adult fishes to travel over distances they wouldn't have before because it's provided little oases along the way. In fact, the reefs of Flower Garden Banks and Stetson Bank are actually very popular dive destinations for those who know about them. And that's due primarily to the wonderful wildlife that's found there. So let's take a look at what that might be. Let's start with invertebrates. These squishy, spiny, or spirally critters that describe just about any invertebrate you find in your tanks or out here on the reefs are literally niche animals hanging out in all the nooks and crannies that you well know. And you probably recognize the octopus and the sea urchin. And if any crowd recognizes something, the stuff in the bottom right is bound to be you all. These are Christmas tree worms. They're um, related to feather duster worms and several other segmented worms that have a tube surrounding their body, and then they just put their colorful gills out to feed and uh, get oxygen from the water. So each pair of spiraling, spiraling trees here belong to one worm, and they come in a variety of colors. You see yellow and orange here. I've also seen purple and blue and red and green, and you just can't imagine all the colors for these uh, Christmas tree worms. And these are some of the most obvious invertebrates, but divers also find shrimp, crab, glossers, sea cucumbers, snails, you name it. Whatever you would typically find on a reef can be found at the flower garden banks. Anemones and sea stars aren't very plentiful at the flower garden banks. They're there, but they're either really well hidden or very small. And so we, it's not like up when you're diving around, you're likely to see uh, either one of those. You might see brittle stars, especially if you're out at, diving at night. Um, but you can almost never see anemones. I've only, in all the diving I've done, like occasionally found a few little chemicals sticking out of a crevice somewhere. Uh, of the three banks, Stetson is probably the best location for spotting invertebrates because of the more open ridges there. We also have a variety of brightly colored reef fish species, as you would expect with a coral reef, from colorful angelfish and parrotfish to tiny damselfish and odd shaped puffers. The fish you see here are very typical coral reef inhabitants. Again, we don't have all the parrots you're going to find in other places in the Caribbean, all the angels, so forth. Um, but we still have very colorful variety out here. At certain times of year, the reefs are literally swarming in juvenile fish, especially early in summer. I mean, just thousands of tiny little brightly colored fish everywhere you can imagine. 
And we also have one, at least one not so typical fish. Golden smooth trunk fish in the top right is a color variation of the smooth trunk fish that you see in the picture just below it. The smooth trunk fish is found throughout the entire Caribbean. It's also found in the flower garden banks, but the golden smooth trunk fish is only found at the flower garden banks and it's supposedly been reported also from the Bay Islands in Honduras. And this is just a genetic variation. If you look at the um, fins on the regular smooth trunk fish, they're bright yellow, so the yellow genetics are in there. And somehow they just kind of morphed over time because of this isolated population, most likely creating this yellow. So when people first saw this, they thought they had a brand new species and they're all excited and did all the workup and the DNA, DNA tells us it's exactly the same fish, just a different color morph. So you've got the standard coloration and the golden coloration right next to each other on that system. And of course, I have to mention the really big stuff. Magnificent, awe-inspiring megafauna. So whale sharks in the warm summer months, sea turtles, and manta rays year-round. In fact, the area around flower garden banks is known as a manta nursery. Many of the animals we see there are juveniles, and even though they're smaller than mantas you're likely to see elsewhere, their size and grace are still impressive. In fact, we thought maybe we had a subspecies out here because our mantas seem to be smaller than those you'd see in Hawaii and other locations. Um, and it wasn't until a researcher more recently said, no, what you're seeing mostly are juveniles, that's why they're smaller. So um, we can identify the individuals by the patterns on their bellies. And so far we've identified over 100 mantas and we have that in the mantis catalog online. Right now the online version only has about 80 some if I'm not mistaken. I've got a lot of work to do to update that. We've got to revise those pages to start with. So a lot of work ahead of me on the website. Divers out in the sanctuary can contribute to the catalog by sharing belly photos of any manta rays they come across. Other views are good too, but it's the belly markings that are important for identification. To send the photos along with date, time, place they're taken, because I heard some of you out there are scuba divers, and you can send that to flowergarden at noaa.gov. That's our generic email address at the sanctuary. So, based on all the stuff I've shown you so far, you can see these coral reefs and coral communities really are special. But again, they're not the only kind of habitat in the sanctuary. Up to now, everything we've talked about is relatively shallow, anywhere from about zero to 160, 200 feet. Now, let's talk about the fantastic mesophotic or low light habitats down deep. Very little light reaches these habitats and they are beyond the reach of recreational dive skills. So we visit these areas with remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. These maneuverable underwater vehicles have cameras and grasping arms and they allow us to take photos, put light on the situation, just explore, and we can even collect samples to take, bring back to examine and learn from more later. Methodic habitats are something that all 17 banks of the sanctuary have in common. If you think about the name, meso means middle, photic means light. So we're talking about middle light areas. These are not as dark as if you went down thousands of feet to some of those deep reefs off of the West Coast or off of Alaska and other areas. It is definitely cooler down here. They said temperatures are probably in the 40s or 50s when we get down in these areas, but we have different kinds of corals that grow in these habitats. Bushy black corals, like the one you see in the top right here, flexible octocorals you see in the bottom and the left. Um, they're structurally different from reef building corals, but still provide great habitat for animals in these mesophotic areas. Black corals are deep water species named for the color of their internal skeleton. And so while the outside of the one you're seeing here is brown or orange, you might find them in white, green, red, all different kinds of colors. But they tend to have this bushy look to them for the most part. Some of them look a little more like sea bands and a little more like some of the octocorals. Octocorals are named for the shape of their polyps, which have tentacles and multiples of eight, as I mentioned earlier. Both of these are softer, more flexible types of corals that bend and sway with the current around them. Um, think sea bands. And one of the things you might have noticed, the pictures of the coral cap that I showed you, no sea fans, no soft corals of any kind up on the shallow reef where we can dive. Nobody's quite clear to why, um, but our reefs are very different from other coral reefs in that way. We certainly don't know as much about the deep corals, even though we see these beautiful things down there and they remind us of some of the things we see in shallow areas elsewhere. Um, we're still studying them, learning about the creatures that live among them, as, and we still need to continue exploring and understanding these to get to the level where we are with the shallow water species. We just haven't been doing it as long. And we continue to explore, learn, and build species catalogs as we go. What a lot of people don't realize 
Because on the early days, exploration out in the sea was all by scraping things up off the bottom. And so you brought something up so it was no longer alive after very long on deck. And then you stuck it in a jar and preserved it. And then you went back to the lab and you studied it. And you might know how many spicules or polyps or whatever parts they have. And you can describe them in great detail on paper and do drawings of them and everything. But they didn't know what these things looked like alive. So here we are exploring in the 90s, the 2000s, and we're bringing up things, we're taking photos of things and sending them back to these experts who've been studying these jars for so long and saying, what do we have? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what these things look like alive. So that's where the work the Flower Garden Banks has been doing has been very important because we're then, we have to georeference these things and go back and find them again. We can uh, collect samples, go with the photographs, and then we send them together. And they can compare the good things we already have in jars from explorations long ago, and then make sure in that way that they're getting the right look of the living animals to go with the, um, the preserved ones. And occasionally we find new species. In the past 15 years, researchers have identified new shrimp, squat lobster, and black coral species in these areas. And many of the mesophotic reefs we've seen are covered in crustose forms of algae. You all are probably familiar with this, with the live rock. All that great red stuff that grows there that's really good and healthy for a reef. These are plants rather than animals that create calcified structures. Some are leafy and almost look like corals, like you see in the bottom right image. This is a whole section of reef at East Flower Garden Bank that we never had seen until 2019 when we were doing ROV exploration. As much as people have been exploring out there, They've never seen this before and they were amazed and we took samples and it looked like this may be a new species. Other algae form nodules that look more like rocks as you see in these other two images. Some of these are created entirely of the crustose forms of algae while others are formed by algae encrusting over other items. And in many cases these algal nodule habitats provide a base for black corals and octocorals. You see encrusting sponges in these photos. I mean just all sorts of stuff. So the live rock kind of stuff that, you're, that you think about uh, using in aquariums this is creating rubbly areas. This is kind of between the deep mesophotic coral reefs and the shallow coral reefs. We've got these intermediate areas, and they see a little mix of things from above and from below, and we call these algal nodule zones. Now, another name for algal nodules is rotolith. And some of these algae continue to teach us things about mesophotic habitats, and again, sampling tells us we've got new species probably in these areas as well. There's a, a researcher who loves this stuff, who works over at LSU, and she is thoroughly studying this stuff and telling us new things all the time. And in addition to reef habitats, Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary has some unique geologic features that you don't find very often. Features I'd like to point out for you are at Horseshoe, East Flower Garden, and Alderdice Banks. So kind of from end to end of the sanctuary. Horseshoe Bank has mud volcanoes. These are cones of mud with methane gas escaping from the top, so no lava. No actual volcanic activity out here. They just look like volcanoes in their shape and the fact that something is slurping out the top. Uh, if you look at the photo here, you'll see that there's this gas bubble right here at the very top. And the, tr this, the mud here is so silty and fine that just a gas bubble coming out and opening kind of pulls the trail of the silt up with it. And then as the bubble bursts, the silt just kind of falls down and out to the side. We think that's probably how these cones formed over a long period of time. I was on an exploration with ROVs uh, many years ago, and we went from bottom to top of one of these and, and identified it as being 100 feet tall. So very prominent features out in these otherwise muddy, silty areas that have just formed these big cones. East Flower Garden is also known for having a brine seep. This is an area where super salty water from the salt dome underneath is seeping up to the sea floor. There are brine seeps all over the Gulf of Mexico, but most of them don't have a nice little depressed area to concentrate in. So they come up and they just kind of dissipate and mingle out with the rest of the seawater. So they get kind of diluted faster. But here at East Flower Garden Bank, there's this depressed area right by this one uh, brine seep, and the water settles. It's super dense. It's over 220 parts per thousand. And so it's super dense. It settles beneath the natural sea, sea the natural salinity seawater, and it just settles there in a, in a lake about 10 inches deep. The density difference is so distinct that you can actually see the surface. Look at this picture. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. See? This picture, oops, where do we go? Here we go. Went backwards by accident. There we go. Uh, this picture on the right, you are looking at the surface of the briny water here, and it's disrupted by the um, 
the flow from the rotors on the ROV. So it's kind of rippling the surface there, and it looks like you're looking at a puddle, right? Now think about this. This is the ROV camera that's already underwater. So you're underwater looking at a puddle. That's how distinct this surface layer is. And the white stuff you see on the left picture here, those are all bacterial mats, and that's all that can live in here. The salinity is way too high for anything else to live there. Fish swim over it, but they can't live in it. Occasionally, they might dip into it. That's been observed a few times. They dip in and come right back out. Might be the same kind of thing as you might do in an aquarium. Uh, we do a freshwater dip to get rid of parasites. Just kind of doing it the other direction, kind of going to a hypersaline area and, and maybe getting parasites to drop off. So it's possible that's what fish are trying to do. And then the last area I'd like to point out is altered ice banks. And rather than gas or salt seeping up through the rock floor, through the seafloor, uh, altered ice bank has volcanic rock that has emerged from the seafloor. This basalt is 77 million years old, and it's the oldest known rock on the continental shelf in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you're not familiar with basalt, it has volcanic origin. And yet we don't know specifically of volcanic activity in this area of the Gulf. We've still got volcanic rock here, and that's what makes this area really unique. So these are just some of the highlights from the sanctuary. I hope this has helped you understand that we have a national treasure right here off our Texas shores. Um, it's a truly marvelous place we've chosen to protect because of its ecological and its economical importance. And now it's up to us, aquarists, hobbyists, divers, everybody, to make sure it stays that way. How we treat it today has implications for whether or not it sees tomorrow. And with that, I'm just going to share a couple more quick slides. So if you want to keep learning more after our discussion today, because I'm, I'm very happy to take questions. I'd like to point to get out for you that we have email lists and you can get to them on our website in the news section. There's a place to sign up for email lists. We have different ones there to explain about them on the page. We are on uh, social media. Um, we are on Facebook and Twitter, and now we've joined Instagram as of this summer, so you can find us in those places. We love sharing the beautiful photography from out here that many of our staff have collected over the years and continue to find new things to bring you. This month, we're doing alphabet days. Today was M is for mantis. Um, tomorrow will be N. I can't tell you what it's going to be. You'll have to check in with us to find out. And for those of you who are divers, if you're interested in visiting the flower garden banks and doing fish surveys, you can do that by doing photographs and submitting them to iNaturalist, or there's ways to participate in an actual survey project where you count fish and, and species and so forth. And if you want more information on those, I'd be happy to help you out. And with that, I believe, I think that's it. That's the end. Okay, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We were clapping here, but we were all on mute on this side, so you couldn't hear all of us. <laughs> well, now you've got more than one mic unmuted. You just need to be careful there. Awesome. Awesome. That was that was an awesome presentation, Kelly. Thank you. It was. And and when you had the diver part, there was a, a whole this whole section over here went. <laughs> <laughs> Well, keep in mind that anyone every year we have a photo contest. I heard you guys doing your own uh, photo contest every month, the best best picture or whatever. Um, every year, the whole entire National Marine Sanctuary System has a Get Into Your Sanctuary photo contest that runs Memorial Day to Labor Day. So it's done for this year. We had over 700 entries this year, I just found out today. In the past, the most we have was about 200. So it kind of exploded this year. Um, maybe it's the 50th anniversary excitement. Everybody's getting out there. But if you do go out to the sanctuary and you take photos, please keep in mind the uh, contest for next year. Awesome. Awesome. So my first question is, how would someone get into a voluntary group like you guys? So on the email list page, we have a place you can sign up to be a volunteer um, but we don't have that many volunteer opportunities, I'll be perfectly frank. We are a very small sanctuary. We have an entire staff right now of 11 people. And um, we're short-staffed right now. We're missing a research person and an education person. So until we're fully staffed, we can't even think about getting out and doing more things or managing more volunteers. Um, but even so, what we do usually need volunteers for is going out to do community events 
And like I said, right now we're not doing very many of those because of our staffing issues. But um, when we go out to an Earth Day celebration or an Ocean Day celebration or Bay Day or whatever those events are, um, we usually call on volunteers to come help us staff the booth. There used to be at least one staff, the staff person there, so we could learn the lingo and everything from um, the staff person and then just kind of help out talking to guests about the sanctuary and helping them understand or play games to learn about the sanctuary and so forth. We also sometimes um, will ask people to help us with online stuff. So every once in a while, we need to update our list of all the dive shops in all the Gulf Coast states and things like that. So I put out calls sometimes for people to do web research for me and just get back to me with updated information because we know dive shops and um, dive clubs are changing all the time. And so we, we want to make sure that we're not leaving them out of the information we're sharing since this is a popular dive destination. And so sometimes we get volunteer help with those kinds of projects, things that can be done online at home and then. So if you're interested in doing anything, um, sign on to that volunteer list. And then I will just, if I have something, I will send it out to the list and then take people who respond and uh, see what I can do. Cool. Awesome. You're welcome. Any other questions? Sorry, we have a question here, um, but we were on mute. And it was. What, what are the accommodations for getting there, and are there accommodations there? So that is the challenge. Flower Garden Bank Sanctuary is 115 miles offshore, the dive, and, and Stetson is off, is 80 miles out. So um, the main boat that goes out there is the Fling. It's operated by Texas Caribbean Charters out of Freeport, Texas. And we have them listed. We have on our website, there's a section called Visiting the Sanctuary, and there's a section in there for dive charters. And basically, it's a liveaboard dive boat. Most They have weekend trips, but they also have weekday trips, usually two to three days. Um, a weekend trip, for example, you get on the boat Friday night, you sleep on the way out, you get up in the morning, you start diving, you dive through the day, you do a night dive, you sleep overnight, you get up in the morning, do a couple more dives, and you come back um, to be back at the dock by uh, Sunday evening. It takes uh, about seven hours to get out to the Flower Garden Bank by boat. Wow. Wow. There are some other dive, dive charters listed on that page. We don't know much about them. They tell us they go to the Flower Garden Bank Sanctuary that may mean just Stetson Bank because that's the closest one. We don't we don't know. They only take a few people at a time, but the fling takes about 30 people at a time. Wow. That is awesome. When we go out, we have our own research vessel, and our vessel only holds 14 people, and four of those are crews. So that allows us to only put 10 divers on at a time, although sometimes the crew can help us out with those activities. And so when we go out to do research and monitoring, um, we're very limited at the staffing we can have, so we try to make the most of our days, and we usually work 12-hour days when we're out there. But we do the same thing. We leave out the night before we want to be there, and we sleep on the way out, let the captain stay awake, and then the second captain takes over the next morning, and... Um, we get to work out there in the sanctuary. So we have to maximize the time. It's not easy access. Awesome. Thank you. And we have another question from the side. What are the shark species there? What was that? What are the shark species there? Shark species. Uh, we've got spinners, uh, sandbars, whale sharks. Um, scout hammerhead, nurse sharks, reach, uh, Caribbean reef sharks, those are the most common ones out there. And yes, I've swum with a whale shark out there. Wow. I swam over top of a whale shark. I wasn't with it. It was with me. <laughs> I was top looking down at it. <laughs> but I've seen them at the surface right close to the boat. I just hadn't been in the water with them except that one time. Yeah. But one other thing that might interest you all um, as aquarists is that, um, I don't know if you've heard about the stony coral tissue loss disease that's ravaging the Florida Keys and several other coral reefs in the Caribbean. Yes. Um, but there's a whole program going on to treat the disease as much as possible. They've been developing techniques over the years since they discovered it, started in 2014, and they've been doing a coral rescue program. So they have been taking healthy corals, small healthy corals of a certain species, and you make sure you're getting genetic diversity, and they're putting them in holding areas with zoos and aquariums across the country as a repository in case the reefs actually die 
to the point that they can't recover on their own, and then we have corals we can restore with. So they actually collected live corals. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we, we started seeing what looks like stony coral tissue loss disease at the flower bird bank. And it has not been confirmed yet that that's what it is, but it looks like that's probably what it is. We've already started treatments within a week of discovering the, the lesions on the corals, but they also started collecting some small corals out the flower garden bank to put in, in a coral uh, holding as well. And Moody Gardens has those corals right now. We just started that a couple weeks ago. So uh, those of you um, who raise corals, you know how challenging that can be. And uh, Moody Gardens has gotten really good at it over the years, and they're one of the repositories for both the Florida corals and the flower garden bank corals. So we have a question on chat. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I do. Let me look at it. It was on the screen, but then it went away. Oh, that's about the stony coral tissue loss disease. Yeah. Um, so we are following the protocols put in place by all those people who started tackling it in the Florida Keys. We actually put together a response plan for the stony coral tissue loss disease um, that was finalized last year. We were hoping beyond hope that it wouldn't get there. We had people going out on the plane start uh, sanitizing their gear before getting on the boat. And because we just don't know what transmits it. We know it travels through the water, but we don't know how. And so if it's in dive gear and all those kind of things, the least we can do is disinfect that stuff before jumping in a new place and possibly carrying you know, disease from one place to the next. But it's more, it's, it's possible that it's, it's ships that are doing it. It's possible it's just current driven in general. But like I said, it, it seems to be out there. So the protocols we had in place were enacted immediately. Um, they put together a paste with antibiotics in it, and they actually go underwater with syringes full of this paste, and they squirt it out, and they use it like play doh and patch it in around the edge of each of the lesions they see on the corals where they can. The problem is the flower garden has so much coral. There's no way we're going to be able to treat it all. So they got out there, and they treated 120 different colonies uh, two weeks ago now, the week after it was discovered. And if it turns out not to be stony coral tissue loss disease, it's not going to hurt us to have been doing this. But if it is, then we need to get on it as quickly as possible. What we're hoping, and we really want this to be true, I, I have no idea how if we'll be overly optimistic or not, but with the lionfish invasion, invasive lionfish, the flower garden banks is holding its own. It has not seen loss in species, uh, abundance or uh, diversity because of lionfish, whereas all the other reefs that have this lion, invasive lionfish problem are seeing that. And it could be because the flower garden banks are so healthy and so resilient that they're managing it all on their own, right? We're going out there, we're doing removals, but it seems to be taking care of itself. Even after two years of not doing any removals, um, our fish populations still seem like they're holding steady. So maybe with stony coral tissue loss disease, the, our corals will be resilient enough. We just don't know. And we're not going to take the chance that they, they can handle this all on their own. So we're doing what we can. Um, unfortunately, we can't get out there all the time. We can't get enough people in the water at one time. Uh, so we're looking at ways to make more of that happen. But we're going to treat and treat and treat as much as we can to see if we can at least keep it to a minimum um, because we have an abundance of the species that are affected by this uh, disease. Wow. Yeah, it was very depressing. We had some, a lot of crying faces around the office and researchers in the area when it was first reported. Hard. Yeah, I can about imagine. Any other questions? I was just going to ask the same thing. Any, any other questions? Do you foresee a time when uh, clubs like ours might be able to help with the coral um, holding program as volunteers? Wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, the quarantine aspect of it is really critical to make sure they're not exposed to other water systems, to make sure they're not exposed to other corals that might have issues. Um, I know you all work on that because you want to keep your tanks healthy too. So I, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, it just, you know, this is the first time it's gone out to zoos and aquariums and they started taking on that, that issue. Uh, it, it depends on how serious it gets, I think, as to whether they will start looking to the, the hobbyist 
um, help out. Uh, it's always possible. Yeah, I can about imagine. Hmm. Are there any other questions? It's to get great coraled out and take them away in the first place. So we don't want to do it any more than we have to. Yeah. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking that we have a lot of really dedicated hobbyists that would, you know, love to help out if we, if, you know, if the situation ever gets desperate, reach out to us and, you know, we might be able to help in some way. Yeah. Um, the other thing you might do is look to your local zoo and aquarium facilities and see if there's some of the holding sites for these corals. And maybe that's something you can get involved with that way. Oh, yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. I actually have been a dive volunteer at Moody Garden for 18 years. Wow. And uh, I got to help put together some of the tanks that they're holding those corals in now when I was there volunteering. I haven't been volunteering there since the pandemic started. And I'm probably not going to go back at this point, but I put in a good 18 years diving the tanks and helping with other things behind the scenes. Wow. Interesting. Anything else? So Kelly, thank you so much for having come. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Somebody no, wanted to ask a question. If you have other questions, check our website. A lot. I mean, almost all that I covered today is actually up there on the website. So if you want a little more detail or a look at, um, you know, what the bank is like, we have a separate page for each bank at the sanctuary. You can see some photos from each of those banks and what some of the deep habitats and shallow habitats look like. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, and we'll be taking this recording. It'll go up on the club YouTube channel. And I've got feedback when I speak here, so that's a little challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, but now, now we'll never get sound again. <laughs> but thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, and what you'll see when you go on the YouTube channel, see, we'll never get sound again. Oh, wow. Yeah, I wasn't kidding. It's, it's like magic when it comes together. Really? <laughs> it's really <laughs> finicky. Um, but what we've been seeing here um, up on the screen, it's different if you watch it on the YouTube channel. So some of Kelly's graphics that you couldn't see because here up on the big screen, they were underneath. That whole part is gone. So uh, I love to go back and, and see what I missed because it was underneath the, the different Zoom things. Um, so uh, Kelly, thank you so much. I'm going to do a couple housekeeping things and you must be present to win. I had, oh, they're, they're trying to get the sound to go again. <laughs> I know it's finicky, isn't it? Um, so I have four people on YouTube. I have Keith. Drew, Robin, and Drex. Am I missing anyone for the drawing? So we're gonna do um, our Zoom people first. I almost said our YouTube people first. Uh, and this evening. So, these are the little names. Do you want to help me out? And I'm going to put these in the thing and you get to draw the names. Mm -hmm. You see the little red bag or a big red bag? Oh, you put it away. So the first drawing is going to be for a four ounce Hycine Energetics food. It's Drex. Oh my goodness, Drex, you have this like rigged. Oh. <laughs> okay. So Drex, I will put this in the mail to you. Okay. We have another winner. Oh, wait, I just, I, I just put the food in the bag. Drew, 
congratulations to Drew. Um, so Drew, I'm not sure which Drew you are, so please reach out to me and get me your contact information. I am Fish Think Tank on the website. I am Lisa at DFW mass.org is my email address. I'm not get putting my cell phone here because <laughs> it'll go up on the recording. Um, but Drew, please uh, reach out because Drew just won the eight ounce Zoom people thing. Yay! Oh, he says he'll text me again. I have his number. So cool. Or if it's a female Drew, yay. Um, so cool. All righty. And then we have for our in house um i'm first going to do one thing which is all of these here on the floor i know you zoom people can't see them i want to say a giant thank you from the club to glass aquatics so this evening we are here at glass aquatics in hearst off of harwood um is it road avenue road, road uh, 522 harwood road um their new big giant gorgeous facility um and thank you for having us this evening, but thank you for day in, day out, all that both Vanessa and Mike are here. Mike's been hiding from the camera all evening. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, he's saying that's his goal to hide. Um, and so this is for you, this is for your employees, um, from us to say thank you. So thank you. Um, I'll give some to you. Yes. And you can just go reach the other people who are here and see this one. And if you want to do that, well, I'm good favorite. with that. And then we have four. I have to take the other ones out. <laughs> so Keith and Robin, sorry. Uh, so one, two, three, four just went in the bag. And where's the one, two, three, four? We've got our numbers. Oh, you have, of course you have your numbers. <laughs> no, because I want them to love you. Um, I'm okay if they don't love me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this evening, just like we did for Zoom, where we worked up from the bottom, we're going to work up. And the first thing we're going to have is the, um, you guys on Zoom missed it, but, but I, I made a little comment. And then I realized I had more. So what um, Glass Aquatics employees got inside of here is Swedish fish. So the first drawing, first two drawings are for Swedish fish. And then we have Piscine Energetics. So the first person is. <laughs> number four. Who's number four? <gasps> Congratulations. And if you stay after, I'd love to get your picture with your fish. They're very yummy and tasty. They're new fish, so they're extra soft and. and <laughs> yes, they're very squishy and yummy. Oh, I just looked at that. Okay. Number one. A yes. Whoa, got a fish over here. So a fish down. Pass the fish down that way. Oh, you're not no, familiar with Swedish fish? Oh, I love Swedish fish. Okay. I keep looking. Yes. All right. So the next one is for four ounce. And I'd like to thank the bounce back people that um, have already donated these back from round three. Um, so that's how today came together. So um, number two, who's two? Over here. Congratulations, woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! And left in the bag <laughs> is number three. Congratulations, woo -hoo! Nice. You got the grand prize, eight ounce. Um, this is the famous Swedish fish. Yeah. <laughs> no, the regular fish. <laughs> you can eat it if you want. <laughs> um, so let me do a recap of our announcements. Um, congratulations to our August Photo of the Month winner, LJ Grimm 13 user ID. Um, and winners get a $50 gift certificate, your choice of sponsor. So um, please submit your photos and please vote. Um, we will be having another, just for voting next month, we will have another contest where you can win something. Um, just, and it's, it'll be random, sort of like this was this evening, um, but it'll be random. So that'll be October. So in October, just for voting, uh, you will also get something. In addition to the winner will get a $50 gift certificate. So there will be two ways to win in the photo of the month next month. 
Um, our next meeting is going to be October 21st at the Big Little Fish store and Piscine Energetics will be our guest speaker and they are the sponsor who gener generously, very, very generously donated to the club um, for the Ice Storm one year anniversary bounce back um, giveaway. And that's where these uh, food originated from. And oh my gosh, I got a sneak peek of what's coming. So that's gonna be really, um, September and October, we just, you know, power months for guest speakers. Thank you, Kelly, so very, very much. Yes. We yes. have a frag swap for the club at Bob Duncan. We're going back there in Arlington. That's November 5th. Reef of Palooza is October 8th and 9th. Sorry to be jumping around a little bit. And we are still looking for volunteers for Reef Palooza. Um, that helps the club get our table at a discount. Um, and we kind of run things on a shoestring. I think you guys know that. So um, just volunteers and, and whatnot. Um, and then the rest of the schedule's up on the website. So thank you guys for coming out. Feel free to visit. I'm gonna take the, um, I know I've got a couple of little Zooms going. I'm gonna uh, take this one off speaker and then do a store tour. Uh, like you saw, I, I think it was February we were here. Um, and so we'll do that again this evening. Um, so thank you all and have a great week and happy reefing. Thank you again, thank Kelly. You, Kelly. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I, I think we can lost our speaker. I could put it back there. Where's the frequency? Our store didn't lose power. Thank you, oh, Vanessa. Nice. So, yeah, so cool. Um, so if you all didn't hear that, um, <laughs> Let me let me mute this one. And unmute this one. Um, so what Mike was just sharing is Lisa, plug it back in. We can't hear you. Lisa, can you hear me? As soon as you unplugged it, we lost the audio. Audio. There you go. You're back. I'm back. Yeah, I as had to come as, in the second time. As soon as you unplugged your phone, the audio went away. It, it died. So what Mike has been sharing, um, and I'll share with you guys, is Glass Aquatics has giant facility. They um, have a giant aquaculture facility there in the back that you can see through glass, although the lights are off right at the moment. Um, but they never lost power during the ice storm that we all suffered from. I look cross-eyed. And, and so if an ice storm should come back, I know we all learned a lot of tips and ways to get through, but if you can get through on the roads um, and get up here to Hearst, they are offering to take care of your babies, your corals, your fish um, during the next natural disaster like that. We also awesome. And he's also uh, offering to do pickups, which is, you have a heart of gold. Thank you, bless you. 
Yeah, but it was scary. Oh my goodness, it was scary. <laughs> he says he's not scared. Um, so. No, don't flip that camera. <laughs> I'm flipping it on the store. So I'm flipping it on the store. <laughs> and that would be my cup running behind the screen. Um, <laughs> but he has a heart of gold. Um, this was uh, what you see there. That's the big screen that uh, we had the Zoom people up on. Um, here's more of the store. Oh, hi, wave. Um, here's their uh, club banner. Um, and so I'm going to walk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start over on this side. How about that, Mike? Um, I'm just going to do a little store tour for the Zoom people. Um, so they've got three rows of fish. The fish are going to sleep for the night. This is after hours. In fact, the entire club meeting this evening, Glass Aquatics was gracious enough to stay open to host us after hours here. Um, so this is definitely like, this is late night party time for the fish here. Um, so you're gonna have to come in during business hours to see them awake and happy. Um, although they look breath, oh, look at that, he's so pretty. Um, and so lots of little babies here. And then this window, um, it's even harder to see through the recording. Oh, but they do have lights on back there. Um, so you can see a little bit more. Right in front is um, a wet saw for fragging. But then there's giant, one, two, three, four, five, giant, giant tanks back in there, um, as well as some small tanks. Uh, set up for aquaculturing. Um, and then if you're not familiar, um, I've made use of these facilities myself. They also have an area, you can't see it all, it's over to the left-hand side, um, but they are one of the only, if not the only um, local area fish store that if your fish is sick and you need true quarantine, true medication, like copper, maintain at the right level, um, whatever kind of medications your fish needs for whatever it's suffering from. Um, it, it, there's a cost for it, but it's nominal compared to what your, your, your fish is. Um, and so you, you can bring your fish up here and that's what I did when my fish um, was sick. And they took care of my fish for me when I was really busy and got him all better. In fact, he's grown quite a lot since then. They probably wouldn't even recognize my tank. Um, but anyhow, so we're just moving around, seeing. This is their cheapo depot. The things here um, change. Um, it's different uh, equipment that you can get at discount. Uh, here's more. Here's people buying things. <laughs> just sliding through. Um, now we're gonna. Uh, we're in the front of the store. This is dry goods. Um, tanks. I'm on the back side of most of these tanks, sorry. Um, so we'll circle around. And then there's smaller tanks here as well. Oh, look, even a little five gallon. Um, and so oh, I'm, I'm looking to see if I can walk down the, the front aisle. I'm a little on the fluffy side, so I'll just use the camera down the aisle. And then a giant wall of dry goods here as well. So this is the front door, the inside of the front door. Um, and just ceiling to floor, a little bit of everything is here in stock. Um, and so um, food, medication, filters, you know, uh, testers. So if you have one of those, oh my gosh, this broke, or I need this and I don't wanna wait, um, they probably have it in stock. This could be one of your go-to places. Um, so they are a sponsor of the Hobby Club um, and we all love them. This is really cool. This is their filling station. If you haven't seen pictures of this online yet, um, they do uh, fresh water because, you know, so <laughs> believe it or not, some people have fresh water fish tanks, um, but then they also have salt water. <laughs> um, and so if you don't make your own salt water, you can get it uh, pre-mixed and they'll put it in a jug for you. But this is like a gas station. So I'm gonna come up and, and just lift up one of these filling pumps. Um, so there, and then there's just like the gas station would, would list for you, you know, salt water, uh, what is it? The, uh, the octane, I wanna say like 87 or 89 and whatnot. So there, there they're saying uh, your salt water is 1.25 here. Um, 
So very fun, makes me giggle. Um, more dry goods. Um, and then more dry goods coming around. And then we're back at three rows of fish along the wall. Oh my gosh, and I circled the entire room and I forgot the center of the room. Um, the center of the room is also filled. Um, I did do a little bit of that frag tank, but I, I kind of went pretty fast and I've got the screen in front of it. So you're not gonna see, this is a, a these are freshwater plants though, um, but they, they have quite an assortment of freshwater plants here in stock. And then there's a screen, sorry, moving, moving right through. Um, so that's the other side of it. And now here's a frag, frag tank. Was there a question? Or is that you? Oh, hi. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, and Glass Aquatics is hiring. So if you would like to work with some amazing people here in the um, DFW Metroplex, um, definitely reach out to Glass Aquatics. They have some openings right now um, and you would be very blessed to work with them. So, cool. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so everybody have a great evening. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Um, you don't have to leave, but I am gonna stop the recording. So. I'm gonna eat. Oh, that's a late night dinner. Uh, yeah. I was a little busy today. <laughs>